got the freedom fever. Right, right. right. And I remember how that feels. Right, right. right. There was a guy named Jim Leather. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the National Museum of American History. And thank you so much for coming out on such a rainy and cold night. Uh, my name is Christopher Wilson, and I am director of the program in African American Culture here at the museum. Uh, tonight, as part of our uh, uh, commemoration of the bicentennial of uh, President Abraham Lincoln, which uh, for us began with putting together an exhibition that's on the second floor or the third floor of the museum, Abraham Lincoln and Extraordinary Life, um, we're offering the first in a series of uh, six conversations about issues that arose during the Lincoln administration uh, that continue to be challenges to Americans today. Uh, Mer Abraham Lincoln's presidency remains crucially important uh, to this day. The complex and momentous issues that uh, Lincoln confronted as president have continued to be exceedingly important and relevant for the nation uh, since his assassination. Indeed, part of Lincoln's legacy uh, is the passionate response countless Americans uh, have to a man who grappled with questions that still confront this nation, uh, the nation that he led through its most serious crisis. The bicentennial of Lincoln's birth is a fitting time to draw museum visitors into a conversation about issues that challenged modern Americans just as they did in the 19th century. Tonight's program is a perfect example of that long-lasting relevance of those issues. Uh, before we get into the program, I would, uh, however, like to put in a plug for our next uh, in the series, and uh, which will be four weeks from today on April 23rd, and we're going to be focusing on Lincoln, the Smithsonian, and science, uh, the, and, and particularly to Lincoln's relationship with the first Smithsonian secretary, Joseph Henry, uh, who became one of Lincoln's uh, chief science advisors, which was an essential uh, relationship during the Civil War, uh, during this period of a multitude of inventions and designs that were presented to the government and uh, needed to be evaluated. Uh, you see on the screen here uh, Lincoln's patent model. Uh, Lincoln was the only president to hold a patent, and this uh, model is on display here in the museum as part of our a part of the national collection. Um, Lincoln was uh, also hel held a lifelong interest in science and felt that uh, research was uh, essential to uh, to the nation. Uh, so to that uh, uh, to that end, we've uh, invited a a, a a panel of historians to um, look at this issue as well as President Obama's uh, new science advisor um, who we've invited. He's not confirmed yet, but that would be a great addition to this program. So that's going to be April 23rd. Um, let me also take the time to thank our sponsors for this program. We're indebted to the Ford Motor Company Fund and the Richard Lounsbury Foundation for their support of the Lincoln Exhibition, also to the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History and the National Endowment Humanities, uh, of Humanities, or, no, sorry, National Endowment for the Humanities for support of this lecture series. Um, I'd also like to uh, dedicate tonight's program to historian John Hope Franklin, who died yesterday at the age of 94. Uh, Professor Franklin was a great friend to this institution and uh, inspiration to me personally, and I imagine to many members of our audience and panel. Uh, our program tonight focuses on arguably the most difficult issue tackled by the Lincoln administration, one of the most challenging for the nation today, uh, issues of race, uh, civil rights, emancipation, and uh, just who can be an American. Uh, in Lincoln's time and 100 years later, many parallel problems resulted in many ways, in, in, in many ways parallel relationships uh, uh, between two presidents and two legendary civil rights leaders. Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass uh, and Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King needed one another, uh, while each having very separate callings that drew them in different directions. The partnerships they developed are fascinating and important to the understanding of the story of America. Uh, to start us out, I'd like to share with you two objects in the museum's collection. The first is this brass ink stand, um, which sat on the desk of Major Thomas Eckert in the War Department Telegraph Office during the Civil War. 
At this time, the War Department uh, handled all of the President's telegrams, and Lincoln often stopped by to learn the latest news of the war. According to Eckert, the President composed an early draft of the Emancipation Proclamation while sitting at this desk in the summer of 1862. Civil rights activist Juanita Williams wore these shoes, and in fact wore them down, as you can see, um, when she and 25,000 uh, other pr uh, protesters marched the 54 miles from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, to demand uh, equal voting rights for African Americans in March 1965. Each of these objects speak to these relationships. The story of Lincoln working on the Emancip Emancipation Proclamation isn't as simple as the president writing alone in the War Department's telegraph office. When Lincoln was working on and thinking about emancipation, he, though he hadn't met yet met Douglas, he certainly would have been on the president's mind as Douglas was so uh, famous and powerful. The demonstrations at Selma are often looked on as an example of King using activism and marches to force Johnson's hand on a voting rights bill for, for which the president felt the time wasn't right. Uh, but the relationship was more complex than that, and the attack on the marchers uh, on Bloody Sunday in Selma uh, caught both the president and uh, Dr. King by surprise and put them each in difficult positions. Tonight, uh, we will explore these relationships uh, with quite a distinguished panel. I'd like, like to introduce them to you now and have them come up and take their seats. Nick Katz is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and historian, is the author of five books, including Judgment Days, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Martin Luther King, and the Laws That Changed America, which won the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award and the Martin Luther King Social Justice Award. He has been a national correspondent for the Washington Post and a Washington correspondent for the Des Moines Register and the Minneapolis Tribune. A graduate of Dartmouth College, he did graduate studies at the London School of Economics and has taught at American University and uh, Duke University. Welcome, Nick. John Stoffer is chair of the History of American Civilization and professor at Harvard University. Among the leading scholars of the Civil War era, anti-slavery and interracial alliances, his most recent book is *Giants: The Parallel Lives of Frederick Douglass, Abraham, and Abraham Lincoln*. Uh, last year, uh, he wrote *The Black Hearts of Men: Radical Abolitionists and the Transformation of Race*, a collective biography of black and white abolitionists that won four major awards. He has appeared on national radio and television shows, lectured widely through the United States and Europe, and was a consultant for filmmaker Gary Ross for a film on unionism and interracial alliances in Civil War Mississippi. Jack. <laughs> Our moderator tonight, uh, we're happy to welcome back to the museum Juan Williams, a senior correspondent for National Public Radio and political analyst for the Fox News Channel. He is author of several books including Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Years, 1954 to 1965, the companion volume to the uh, critically acclaimed television series on PBS, Thurgood Marshall, American Revolutionary, and My Soul Look Looks Back in Wonder, Voices of the Civil Rights Experience, uh, formerly a White House correspondent editorial writer and op-ed columnist for the Washington Post. He has also won an Emmy for TV documentary writing and appears regularly on news programs. Williams brings insight, depth, and humor to a wide spectrum of ideas and issues. Chris, thank you. Good evening, Chris, thank you very much. And uh, John and Nick, thank you for joining us here at the museum. John, let me... Uh, begin with a concept, which is that looking at the pictures that we had overhead just a moment ago, I thought about the, the power equation involved, that in both cases, in looking at Presidents Lincoln and President Johnson, the power was in white hands, and the key was you had blacks as advisors coming to the throne, so to speak, right. to offer a word of advice and it was up to the white man in the room as to whether or not that advice would be heeded. Today, it's an interesting twist on that tale because the president is a black man, and uh, we have a different kind of equation that we couldn't portray in the video. But this is a critical moment in American history where communication across racial lines is of critical importance given the demographics of the day, 
the fact is that there are fewer whites in the country today than ever. There are more people of color, in specific, I think a surprise to anyone, more Hispanics than there are blacks in the country. Right. So the whole notion of listening and the notion of finding common ground across racial lines seems to be to me more critical than ever. And that's why I, I think Chris finds this event one that could be so illuminating for the audience. Let me start with you, John, by talking about where you see common ground between Lincoln and Douglas. I think there's common ground in a number of areas. It's, I like what, how you preface it. Uh, Frederick Douglass would have agreed very much. In fact, his only known work of fiction called The Heroic Slave is essentially a handbook for interracial friendship. And the key for the white is someone who can listen well. In fact, the white protagonist is called Mr. Listwell because he can listen well <laughs> to what blacks have to say. And that was one of the characteristics that Douglass saw in Lincoln. He would, they met, Douglas met Lincoln three times in the White House. Uh, he's the first black man to meet with and advise U.S. president in terms of um, near equality. And one of the things that first struck Douglas is the degree to which Lincoln listened well to what he had to say and tr took seriously his advice. Uh, they had, um, before, they, before Douglas first met Lincoln in 63, they, safe to say that, that Douglas considered Lincoln an enemy. It wasn't until Lincoln passed his Emancipation Proclamation that uh, they began to converge. In fact, the closest Frederick Douglass ever came to, to emigrating to uh, outside of the United States, he planned to move to Haiti he, and had lost faith in the United States ever fulfilling its national ideals was in the immediate wake of Lincoln's first inaugural. Um, so they began, when Lincoln took his first oath, oath of office, they were really at odds because of uh, Lincoln's uh, conciliatory gestures to uh, the Confederacy, to this uh, newly formed uh, uh, Confederate states. Uh, but when, they, when Lincoln, or when Douglas first came to the White House, he'd, a meeting had not been scheduled. Douglas was already the equivalent of a rock star, one of the most, he was a household name. Uh, and he sent up his card, and within two minutes, he's, Lincoln brings him to the White House. And, and uh, Lincoln's capacity to listen well is one of the things that struck Douglas, as I said. Another is that they had, they had lived strikingly parallel lives. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about, is that part of the capacity to listen, uh, it seems to me, would come from a sense of respect for the other's intellect, Mm -hmm. and capacity to hear. That's right. right? So That's right. you have to have that sort of simpatico. That's right. But in this time, which is very different than the time I'm going to talk about with Nick, I can't imagine that they grew up in any similar way. We know that initially Douglas is a slave child. Right. right. Uh, you know, obviously, as you write in your book, benefits from some kind-hearted masters. Right. But Lincoln uh, is growing up in a very different life. As you put it, Douglas has no formal education. Lincoln has some, not much, but some. Less than a year. Both are sort of made of their own metal, but both tremendously intellectual people. Right, right. So just briefly, where do you, how do they come to understand the humanity and intellect of the other? One, from the fact that they both rose up um, through learning how to use words as weapons as young boys and falling in love with language and understanding the power of language uh, and understanding that, uh, that the importance of being great orators at a time in which oratory was one of the only forms of public energy. And they were both great orators. And they were both great orators. Douglas was actually uh, considered a, a superior orator to Lincoln, um, in part because Douglas was considered immensely handsome, very good looking, even his enemies acknowledged it. He had a rich baritone voice that was musical. Uh, so those were gifts that he didn't have a lot of control over. Lincoln, on the other hand, at 6'4", the three adjectives most used to characterize Lincoln were ugly, awkward, and grotesque. Uh, <laughs> not not um, an appealing visual presence on stage. And that was just his <laughs> wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, think, I think the other thing that struck me about this, though, is uh, Douglas had the advantage of listening to black uh, 
ministers. That's right. That's right. As he was coming along. Right. In fact, he spent some time and he preached. Douglas was right. a minister for a so. brief period. So I think that's one uh, important, uh, very important aspect. They also, I mean, despite the ra dramatic radical differences, they, um, they both grew up in um, pretty vicious communities. Douglas also obviously a lot more vicious as a slave, but um, in Lincoln's backwoods community of communities of Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois, uh, the defining aspect of manhood was the capacity to fight hard and drink a lot. Uh, so Lincoln was seen as an anomaly in those communities as someone who fell in love with language. They both defined themselves. And, and, and Douglas, as you tell in the book, yes. would have to fight yes. and fight, fight, fight yes. white people. Exactly. In right. fact, both men as young men defined a fight as a turning point in their young lives. Um, both had enormous respect for each other as self-made men. Now, as self-made men, it was a term that Henry Clay, who was Lincoln's hero, he coined the term self-made men in 1832. Self-made men for them is very different than what most people think of it today. Most people think of self-made men as someone rising up from um, virtually nothing or little and becoming rich. For Douglas and Lincoln, uh, self-made man, self-made men, and for Douglas, self-made women as well, were it was inseparable from social reform. So as you remade yourself, as you evolved, you also sought to reform society and eradicate the evils of your world. So how is it that they, well, I can see why Douglas would want the ear of Lincoln because Lincoln was the president. Right. And you say it only three, three times that they met. Right. But why, and, and from Lincoln's perspective, Douglas is the rock star. Right. But why does he send the carriage and why does he agree to the meetings? He agrees to the meetings and he sends the carriage because Lincoln r realizes finally in Douglas's view that for him to achieve his chief aim, which is to win the war and preserve the Union, he needs blacks on his side, that he cannot do it without the aid of African Americans. And Douglas is making the case that blacks allow, be allowed to join the Union forces. To join the Union forces. As soon as, as, soon as the Confederacy fires on Fort Sumner, Douglas's um, primary uh, goal is to convince Lincoln and Republicans that the only way that they can win the war is to liberate the slaves and arm them. Because Douglas says, until you liberate the slaves, they are aiding and abetting the Confederacy. He famously said, slaves are the stomach of the, of the rebellion. They're growing the food that feeds the Confederates. They're building the roads. They're building the trenches. They're doing the Confederacy's dirty work. If you emancipate them and bring them to um, uh, and arm them, they will then be uh, aiding the... So uh, that is the crux of why Lincoln wants exactly, to listen to Douglas. Exactly. So in a sense, they, they ultimately considered each other friends, but their friendship was profoundly utilitarian. Douglas realized that he needed Lincoln on his side in order to achieve his chief aim, which is to end slavery immediately and work toward racial equality. And Lincoln recognizes that he needs Douglas on his side in order to achieve his chief aim, which is winning the war and preserving the Union. And he understands that Douglas is essentially the ambassador of African Americans. All right. Nick, let's, talk, let's, let's now shift a century forward. I mean, literally, it's a, <laughs> yeah. it's a hundred years. And we come to a quite a similar, it's astounding, the parallels, I think, in these relationships, to LBJ and Martin Luther King, Jr. And let me start, just as I started with John, by saying listening is key. And why was it that LBJ decides he's going to listen to this Baptist minister? As we were talking about what a good listener Lincoln was, to all appearances, LBJ wasn't a good listener. I think it's <laughs> deceptive. But when you listen to uh, these marvelous tape recordings of Johnson's telephone conversations, uh, including conversations with King, LBJ does most of the talking. And yet he imagine, uh, and yet he managed to accumulate huge amounts of information from the people he listened to and the questions that he asked. Um, LBJ and Martin Luther King were brought together by a crisis. The crisis was the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 
November of 1963. I don't think enough attention has been given to just what a crisis this was for the nation. Mm. Uh, to begin with, in the opening hours, even the opening days, uh, the president, the CIA, the new president, the CIA, wondered what's going on here. We're in the midst of a very tense Cold War with Russia. Uh, so did the Soviet Union have something to do with this? Johnson instinctively and immediately realized that he needed a lot of friends real fast. And uh, what Johnson did in that first week, the number of people from different walks of life that he reached out to is amazing. From business, from labor, from religion, uh, from his own party, from the Republicans and very much the civil rights leaders, very much. The including same. Dr. King? Including Dr. King. The president's first conversation with Dr. King, the assassination is the 22nd. On the 25th, he calls Dr. King, and it is one of these recorded conversations. Anyone can get on their computer, go to the LBJ Library website, and you listen to these conversations. And what becomes clear very quickly is that both Johnson and King sized up the situation exactly the same way. And what they saw in the assassination of President Kennedy, aside from the fact that it was a tragedy, a deep national tragedy. It presented a tremendous opportunity. Dr. King shed, he didn't have time to shed tears for John F. Kennedy. And, uh, and President Kennedy hadn't done much in the way of advancing what Dr. King and the civil rights agenda was. As you listen to this conversation, you see that King sees the fact that we're in a crisis, the fact that the nation is feeling great guilt about the assassination of its young leader, he sees this as an opportunity to get that stalled civil rights bill through Congress. And that's the thing that's on his mind when he talks to the president. It is also the thing that is on President Johnson's mind. King says to the president, uh, Mr. President, I don't think there's anything you could do more to honor uh, President Kennedy's message than to pass the, 19th, the, the, the Civil Rights Act. And it is a day or two later, Johnson goes before a joint session of Congress, and this was the principal emphasis of that speech aside from that we have to pull together as a country. Now, you said, by the way, is it the 22nd or 23rd? The assassination is the 22nd. And, is the, and you said that's the first time they spoke? No, they, no, that wasn't the first time okay. they spoke. That was the first. After the, after the assassination. That was three days later was the first time they w spoke. When was the first time that these two men spoke to each other? They spoke to each other I don't know about when Johnson was a senator. They spoke with each other a number of times when Johnson was vice president. And uh, his experience as vice president was extraordinarily important to what happened after he became president. President Kennedy, uh, he had to give Johnson something to do. He gave him the space program and he put him in charge of the equal opportunity commission. Uh, Eisenhower had had a, something to look at civil rights, and Kennedy carried that forward a little bit further, and he put Johnson in charge of it. Johnson didn't want to be in charge of it, but once he was, <clears throat> Johnson became an absolute tiger. And uh, some of the wonderful things I learned in doing this book was Johnson always restless thought the Kennedys were moving too slowly. They didn't know what they were doing. And Johnson convinced Kennedy uh, 
that the only way this issue was going to move forward was by, instead of treating it as a legal issue, he had to treat it as a moral issue. And, and when Kennedy finally, a couple of months before he was killed, made it a moral issue, he was following Johnson's advice. So, Was that advice that in any way had been communicated by Dr. King? Um, Dr. King had trouble getting through to the Kennedys. Um, the, the most important meeting, and uh, John F. Kennedy <clears throat> studiously avoid, avoided seeing Dr. King alone for a reason. Uh, if a president invited Dr. King to lunch or to dinner to, or to sit with him in the Oval Office, he was immediately going to be, see, be besieged uh, with hundreds, if not thousands, of letters of hate mail, uh, you know, saying pretty vicious things. Uh, Kennedy said of Johnson, uh, Kennedy said of King, when somebody was saying they needed to get together, he was saying, you know, having lunch with Dr. King is sort of akin to, have, to inviting Karl Marx to lunch, you know. Uh, so there was, uh, he saw Dr. King only in groups of the other civil rights leaders, the other major leaders, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP, Whitney Young of the Urban League, sometimes the young firebrands, including John Lewis, now a distinguished member of, of Congress. The one conversation that he had with King alone that I can recall was when they brought Dr. King to Washington, first an assistant attorney general, then Robert Kennedy, the attorney general, then John F. Kennedy, the president, each met with Dr. King to tell him that he had to stop palling around with one Stanley David Levison. Uh, the Iago of the story of King and Johnson is J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, who was spewing poison about King uh, into the ear of Kennedy every chance he got and to Johnson almost every day. And uh, the Kennedys were listening and they were trying to persuade Dr. King that he had to break off the relationship with Levison. So the one time that Kennedy meets with King. Alone. Kennedy is lecturing King. Precisely. But with Johnson, there is much more of a mutuality. With Johnson, starting from the day of the assassination is a realization that they seriously need each other to achieve, Johnson to achieve his objective, which was not only to bring the country together, but for a whole host of reasons to pass this civil rights law. And that was Dr. King's principal objective. So they had reasons to work together. Now, Nick, when you hear me talking with John about President Lincoln and Douglas, do you see parallels there? Oh, I, th I mean, the parallels are awesome. Yeah, they are. Uh, they are. The parallels between what happened in 1865, uh, well, in 1863, yeah. what happened in 1963, uh, and then the parallels um, of the second inauguration in 1865, where um, right after the inauguration, Douglas goes in and talks with, uh, Lincoln calls him in for a visit, and, he's, and he tells him that was a mighty fine speech. And then exactly 100 years later, give or take a few days, the nation is in crisis over Selma, mm. uh, where, the, where the civil rights marchers trying to protest for voting rights for African Americans in the South are brutally beaten. And um, the country's in a real crisis. 
and Johnson talks to King. And again, he needs King, and King needs him. You know, and I remember that when Johnson goes on TV to address the country, I believe he does it from Capitol Hill, about this crisis and the need for civil rights legislation, he uses the language of the civil rights movement. He says, we shall overcome. Mm -hmm. And King is brought to tears as he is watching this from Alabama. He's watching on TV and begins That's to right. cry. Right. John, um, uh, John Lewis told me, and I undoubtedly told you and lots of reporters, that it is the only time he ever saw Dr. King shed tears. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. King was a, uh, he was a lot of things, but he was a very cerebral, but he had to be a very tough guy. And there was a telephone conversation there, not recorded, so we have to rely on uh, a couple of people that were in the room. Um, but one version of it anyway is, uh, this is after the We Shall Overcome speech. Dr. King says um, to the president, uh, Mr. President, you have given us a second emancipation. And Johnson replies to King, and I think it's some of the languages in the speech, that the hero is the American Negro who has brought this mm -hmm. about. Now, John, when you uh, listen to Nick talk a little bit about the 20th century relationship, do you see parallels in terms of what's going on in that 19th century relationship? Yeah, from what Nick just said, after uh, Lincoln uh, issues the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, makes it law January 1 of 1863, uh, Douglas, first of all, it celebrates it the, on the December 31st. Uh, and the first in Tremont Temple in Boston with a number of other blacks and whites. And uh, it's a full day of celebration when the news of the wire comes through that Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation has been made official. There are tears, they're singing um, mostly uh, hymns. In fact, Douglas starts a song of, uh, um, of uh, uh, Gabriel's, uh, the Gabriel's trumpet, a kind of millennialist tune. And soon after that, Douglas says that the Emancipation Proclamation should stand with the Declaration of Independence as the twin births of liberty. Now, Douglas also says in the speech that the Emancipation Proclamation does not free the slaves in any of the border states. It frees the slaves of, of, uh, of, rebel, of the rebels. But he says that with slavery free in Mississippi, there's no way it can last in Maryland or Kentucky or Missouri. And Douglas also says that this first and foremost, slaves free themselves. So he's not trying to hold up the Emancipation Proclamation as this mythic document. He's acknowledging its significance as a political document, but also acknowledging the importance of slaves freeing themselves. Uh, and he places great tribute to Lincoln. Uh, and he, has, he does that from 63 to um, essentially to the end of his life without mythologizing Lincoln. Um, mm. Says that, uh, considers Lincoln the greatest president despite his flaws. Douglas and Lincoln never agreed politically, but Douglas was, I, in my view, a very shrewd political analyst who understood the limitations, not just of Lincoln, but of any president. Douglas was always a radical. He always, I mean, the very fact that in his day he would advocate immediate emancipation and racial equality for all Americans, that's a revolutionary position. He understood that as a president of the United States, there's no way that anyone could advocate that. And so he understood that, that the president needed to do what he could to approach that goal. And uh, in, in my view, one of Douglas's greatest speeches was in 1876, uh, it was a speech to commemorate the Freedmen's Monument in Washington, D.C. It was the anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. It was the unveiling of this Freedmen's Monument where Lincoln is uh, standing over a kneeling slave, one hand over the slave, so that, uh, and the other hand holding the Emancipation Proclamation. Dou Douglas did not like the monument. Uh, and there was virtually the entire heads of state were there. President Grant, Vice President, all of the Supreme Court, Congress, 
Uh, and B Douglas begins his speech by saying, Lincoln was the white man's president. He turns to the white dignitaries in the stands and says, you are Lincoln's children. We are Lincoln's stepchildren. And I can imagine these white dignitaries' jaw just dropping. <laughs> and then he embarks on his classic reversal by saying Lincoln, as president, did what he had to do. And he understood that in order to achieve his aim of winning the war and preserving the Union, which is what he took the oath of office to do, he had to emancipate slaves and bring them and arm them and bring them the, to the Union side. So that ultimately, while we are his stepchildren, we become adopted into the national family. And his understanding of that is his great accomplishment. Well, now, um, Nick, do you want to jump well, in? Well, just, just uh, another parallel uh, struck me in the, between the two relationships. Uh, very, very similar. Frederick Douglass in the case of President Lincoln, <clears throat> Martin Luther King in the case of President Johnson, were always keeping their feet to the fire, mm -hmm. were keeping mm -hmm. the pressure yeah. on them yeah. to do more. Yeah. In both cases, I think, certainly in Johnson's case, that pressure, and LBJ may not have liked it, but he understood it, that pressure was absolutely essential mm. if something was going to happen. Neither Douglas or King uh, flattered right. the president. Right. They wanted something out of the president. And when uh, President Johnson did something that was helpful to civil rights, only then did King uh, congratulate him. Lyndon Johnson was, uh, Abraham Lincoln was an extraordinary complex man. Lyndon Johnson was so damn complicated that people who <laughs> worked for him, uh, including a, a friend Sherwin Markman in the audience, after working for him for the whole presidency, still shook their heads to understand him. One of the characteristics is Lyndon Johnson was very insecure and he was very needy of love. Mm. And he never could get enough love from the civil rights leaders. And it bothered him because he had done some extraordinary things with the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Civil Rights Act. And he wanted them to be all over praising him. And they weren't running around praising him. They wanted more. Now, one thing that I notice in reading these books is it strikes me that Lincoln, by your account, uses the N-word, uh, is rather dismissive of the intellect of blacks at time. Uh, he uses the N-word, although most of the instances in which he uses it, he's paraphrasing it, but he does use it. He was a man of his time. And it would suggest that he had well, a man of his time, let's put it that way. Right. And thinking about LBJ coming from Texas, from the Deep South, and that, to that extent, if you will, uh, again, someone who came from a very segregated society, uh, in fact, more in touch, in some cases, with Hispanic kids than he is with blacks. Um, and yet, in both cases, being forced into this relationship. And this relationship that, to my mind, is so redolent of the slavery that attaches to the history of the American southern states. Mm -hmm. But in both cases, you're saying they were able to overcome this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Johnson's use of the N-word, uh, Johnson uh, never had anything bad to say about King until they broke over the Vietnam War. Uh, Johnson used the N-word um, in, in conversations and stories. But the most important time he used the N-word, I think, was Johnson's. One of his very finest hours mm 
And that was during the 64 presidential campaign. President Johnson went in October, a month before the election, to New Orleans to give a speech to the state Democratic committee. Um, there were a thousand people in the audience. Johnson went in there, his approach to dealing with the South was not to sugarcoat uh, anything, but to say, this, is the, this is, needs to be the law, this is right, uh, this is what we are going to do. In that speech uh, in New Orleans, he told a story, and the story was of an old uh, former senator from Texas who had grown up in Mississippi. And the former senator is talking to some uh, people, and he says to them, he's talking about the what has happened to the Democratic Party in the South. He said, I go and I listen to these speeches, and I, before I die, I want to hear one more good Democratic speech, and all I ever hear is nigger, nigger, nigger. He said, Johnson said this to a thousand people in a hotel ballroom in New Orleans, and then he laced into them about why this has got to stop. Pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. By contrast, though, you portray Lincoln as telling darky jokes all the time. He, uh, he did tell some darky jokes, although there's no evidence after 1862, beginning in 1863, there's no evidence of him using the N-word, which I think uh, highlights the degree to which Lincoln evolved. Uh, and uh, I think a, a, another powerful characterization of Lincoln's limitations is that for all but the last year and a half of his life, he advocated colonization. Uh, of Africa, of freed blacks. So in other words, in Lincoln's vision, it wasn't until you know, mid to late 63, and by some accounts, he, uh, you know, even until the end of his life, Lincoln, uh, in believing in colonization, Lincoln had a hard time imagining American democracy in which blacks and whites live together as citizens. You know, he does abandon uh, the colonization as a, uh, as a solution to ending slavery, which was widespread in the North. And I think that gets at another parallel. And Nick, in your book, you point out the degree to which, uh, which LBJ and, and King um, were revolutionaries and that they were, you know, that the era was not only an era of crisis, but by 68, a revolutionary era. And in 1860, when Lincoln is first elected president, very few whites could imagine a nation in which blacks and whites live together as citizens. Very, only ra really radical abolitionists, maybe 3% of the population, 5% at most. By 1864, four years later, the majority of whites in the North embraced immediate emancipation and large numbers were envisioning them as citizens. That's a, a massive social revolution. So this civil war brings about a social revolution. And Lincoln understands he's part of it and he changes as well. And in fact, what we're talking about here 100 years later is another social exactly. revolution. Exactly. Absolutely. Now, gentlemen, you know, the one thing that jumps out at my mind is Booker T. Washington and his relationship with the White House, right. how does it differ? Let me start with you, John. How does it differ than what Booker T. Washington is doing? Because Booker T. Washington is famously invited into the White House right. and it causes a great deal of stir nationwide. Right, Booker T. is the first African American to be invited to a formal state dinner at the White House by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but Book first of all, Booker T. Washington, unlike Frederick Douglass and unlike uh, Martin Luther King was not championing equality under the law, racial equality under the law, equality of opportunity for all Americans. He, for, for Booker T to survive in the South during an era of massive lynching, uh, he uh, accepted a white over black hierarchy. Uh, so that's one crucial difference. Secondly, um, when TR invited him when Teddy Roosevelt invited him to the White House, it was not to seek his advice. He was not listening to what uh, Booker T had to say. It was, it was uh, more of a, um, a formality. And nevertheless, he was excoriated. Roosevelt was excoriated by Southerners. 
Absolutely. And if you think about it, Nick, are there, again, parallels that you would see uh, in the way that we would, that, the, that John would posit Booker T. Washington as not the rebel, while certainly Douglas was the rebel? Who would play that role in the relationship if, of Johnson and King if King is the rebel? Right. Well, <clears throat> all of the civil rights leaders had a common goal, but some of them went about it in, in a much milder, more traditional way than Dr. King. Roy Wilkins, the head of the NAACP, was a great leader, as was Whitney Young. Neither of them, uh, Dr. King was Mr. Outside. He was bringing pressure on the government from the streets. Uh, the NACP did have demonstrations, but essentially they were operating from the inside in, in the more traditional way of lobbying the government. So uh, Roy Wilkins' approach to LBJ was uh, much more re uh, respectful, much more willing to give Johnson the benefit of the doubt, uh, much less inclined to criticize him about anything because Wilkins thought that's the way you would get things done. That was the traditional way. Uh, King, King's only weapon, well, he had two weapons. One was his eloquence, and, and there's a real parallel with yeah, Douglas. Huge parallel. His eloquence in not only inspiring black Americans to act, action, but his eloquence in inspiring northern whites uh, to support this movement and to be decent. Uh, very, very, uh, that was very, very important. But his primary means of moving the government, and here, uh, you know, we think of Dr. King as a great orator, which he certainly was. You don't, and, you know, unless you really get deeply into the subject, you don't hear much about Dr. King as being the very tough, pragmatic, wily uh, leader, strategist, tactician, politician, because to keep this thing going, he had to get all of these fractious different groups within the movement uh, to stick together. And he had it, and in the critical demonstrations, first in Montgomery, in 55, 56, then in Birmingham in 63, then in Selma in 65. It was not easy to keep the people out in the streets. Thousands of people would get arrested. And just how tough he was in Birmingham when they ran out of adults willing to go to jail, they went to the high schools and when they ran out of high school students. They went to junior high and elementary school students. They, one of the most uh, iconic pictures is of a young kid with a police dog uh, snapping at his, at his throat. Uh, Dr. King had a conversation with uh, Bobby Kennedy, the attorney general. Uh, Kennedy expressed horror that these young children were being pulled out of school and were being exposed um, to, to what was happening to them. And Dr. King very coolly said to the Attorney General, they have rights too. He needed them. Um, so he, he, his approach and the fruit that it bore by creating the two uh, really most important crises that forced the government to act, Birmingham and then Selma, all came from his ability to create a dramatic confrontation with some violence, which would reveal uh, the Southern white authorities and, uh, and the people who came out for what they were. Uh, that was the way he thought he could win the support of, 
enough white people to get these laws passed. Uh, I wanted to give the audience an opportunity to stand up and ask some questions, but before I do, let me just ask the two of you, where was the, if you think of this, of these periods as parallels, where's the Congress of the United States? Where's the rest of the leadership of the country? Great question. <laughs> In Lincoln's day during the Civil War, I mean, I characterize Lincoln as a, a conservative Republican. There were, uh, particularly by 63 to 65, uh, Republicans in Congress were increasingly very progressive. Uh, for example, the um, Congress uh, over Lincoln's veto passes the Wade Davis bill, which is a, a bill that um, would sketch out or govern Reconstruction. Lincoln's um, I plan at the time was a 10% plan, meaning that if 10% uh, of white Southerners uh, agreed or accepted, uh, are willing to come back in the Union, then the states could come back into the Union. And the Wade Davis bill was much more rigorous. It required 50% of the voters in the state to approve of, uh, to, uh, to, to swear by the Constitution and the Union in order for that state to be admitted back into the These Union. These are all the Southern states. These are the Southern, right, the Southern states. So, uh, but Lincoln, uh, I mean, Nick can correct me, but I think one of the characteristics I see between Lincoln and, and Johnson is that both had a very shrewd sense of the makeup of Congress. Johnson probably more so. Uh, and they both had a very savvy sense of, uh, of public opinion and both sought to inspire the public rather than to be mm. slaves to the public. And a, Nick? A contrast between uh, the Congress today and the Congress of 1963 to 1965. Congress today is far more polarized mm. than it was then. To pass those two civil rights laws, Johnson had to defeat filibusters in which 34 members of the Senate could stop anything, and they had stopped every civil rights bill uh, for 75 years. Mm. He needed Republicans. And the makeup of the Senate at that time, there were Republicans from the eastern states who were liberals to moderates. And Jacob Javits. Type. Jacob Javits uh, is one of them. A case of New Jersey, Margaret Chase Smith of Maine. Uh, so without those Republicans, they never could have broken the filibuster. Johnson exercised great skill in getting the Republican leader, Senator Everett Dirksen, uh, to bring the Republicans along. And uh, you know, j just one, one quick comment about the, the so-called Johnson treatment. Uh, Johnson is uh, famous or infamous for the so-called treatment where he grabbed people by the lapels. Hubert Humphrey said he would give you a nose inspection. He, well, he and Lincoln are both six foot four, yeah. and he would yeah. grab someone by their lapels, and Humphrey thought that he was looking down their, their nose. But he, the most important way that Johnson brought members along and brought Dirksen along was by appealing to their higher calling, uh, by saying uh, with, with Dirksen, who was critical to getting, uh, breaking the filibusters for both bills. At one point, he, uh, he could be funny about it. He said, Dirksen, Everett, when this is over, he said, there's going to be a statue on the grounds of the Capitol, the state Capitol in Springfield. And beside Abraham Lincoln's statue, there is going to be a statue of Everett Dirksen, even if I have to build it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was building up, uh, but he was appealing to Dirksen and others' sense of patriotism. Well, it sounds like ego worked. to me. <laughs> but, you know, but it's telling that in both eras, there's no black person, no person of color. I guess no women, right? Well, it might have been women during the, in the 
20th century, but no women, no blacks, certainly in your period, right? Well, Lincoln met with a number of black women, uh, Sojourner Truth. No, no, in the Congress. Oh, in the, yeah, no, no, no. no, no, no. In fact, Lincoln, no, Lincoln, Lincoln j would make jokes about um, women's rights, mocking it. You know, there's, Lincoln understood, and Frederick Douglass, who was, in my view, the foremost uh, male feminist of his day, um, uh, they both understood that for uh, a politician to endorse women's rights was suicidal uh, for being elected to um, especially the presidency. Well, no, the, but the larger point I was making was that you had congresses in both cases where there's no not voice so. coming from right. blacks. Well, not, not totally. Uh, in the Senate, the, the first African American to be elected to the Senate in in the 20th century was Edward Brooke mm -hmm. in 1966. And he got there just in time uh, to help pass the third great civil rights law, the housing law. Right. In the House, uh, there were black members and some of them held very important positions. Um, Congressman Adam Clayton Powell was the chairman of what was in effect the committee that was in charge of education and public welfare. And Johnson's relationship with Powell was just absolutely hilarious. Uh, when Powell called him, when Johnson called up Powell, Powell wanted something and Johnson wanted something and they did business with each other. But you're right, I mean, there were, I would guess in that period, there were no more than five black members of the House. There was an ancient congressman from Chicago uh, by the name of Dawson, and he was the chairman of a committee. And there, and there was a fairly influential black congressman from California. They were a small handful compared to 45 to 50 today. Well, absolutely. In fact, uh, I think it's Clarence Mitchell of the NAACP who's viewed as the 101st senator, but he's up there as a voice outside again of a white council. Right. If anybody in the audience had a question, uh, please stand up and I'll try to repeat it so that everyone can hear. Yeah, we, do, we do have microphones. Oh, here's a microphone. Another parallel that crossed my mind might be the fact that both Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass were so attractive to the presidents because in some respects, they were moderates, weren't they, on their issues? They were brilliant, but weren't there people who were radical abolitionists and then there were the Black Panthers, for example, by, by the 60s or other organizations or individuals who were so far, I don't wanna say out, but so far beyond where Douglas and King were in some respects that they actually were made more attractive by the people who were more radical. And well, in Douglas's era, they weren't just black. Well, let's see what the gentleman thinks. Yeah, um, thanks, Teresa. I think that's a, a great point. I, I, um, I think it, you're right that, that Frederick Douglass uh, was a radical pragmatist. Um, I characterize him as a prudent revolutionary. He, unlike King, he did uh, endorse uh, violent means to um, end slavery if necessary, but I think the context was different. Douglas understood that slavery itself constituted a state of war, uh, and that in order to um, um, win the war and preserve the peace, that violence might be necessary, although he was always advocated peace initially. Um, similar to the civil rights era, there were people who were essentially the, the first generation of black nationalists. People like Martin Delaney uh, were uh, seen as um, more of a threat in a certain degree and certainly more militant than Frederick Douglass. Now, Douglass was a close friend of John Brown. Uh, and Douglas, uh, John Brown tried to convince Douglass to go with him on Harper's Ferry in which he takes over the federal arsenal Try hoping to distribute arms to blacks and slaves and incite a massive slave insurrection that will lead to immediate emancipation. It's one of the last sparks that leads to the Civil War. Douglas doesn't go because he, much as he loves Brown, realized that Brown is not a great military strategist. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's true. In fact, he tries to, he says, you know, John, you're, gonna, you're entering a steel trap. You're going to die. Uh, 
So I think you're, I think you're absolutely right that, that they, were, um, they were both um, pragmatic and prudent in their radicalism, and there were people who were to the... But the, the heart of her question is not that. I mean, I, we all know about Martin Delaney and right. John Brown, but the question I think really is this. Do you think that Lincoln was willing to do business with Douglas because of that? Or do you think that, that those folks were so radical they really were extraneous to the central business and to the relationship? I think that, uh, well, Martin Delaney ended up meeting with Lincoln. Delaney has a profound shift. He um, begins to endorse uh, the Union during, when the Civil War breaks out. But Delaney doesn't meet with Lincoln until 65. Um, Frederick Douglass meet, is the first, first African-American to meet with Lincoln. Uh, in, who, the first intelligent African American um, and someone of near equality. And then after that, there, Lincoln ended up meeting with more intelligent blacks than all um, previous presidents combined. But, what, do you, what do you mean by, you mean like he was meeting with uneducated blacks? And well, in other words, servants as, a, oh. ser, as opposed to servants. Okay. You know, and Nick, what, what would you say is that the case that Johnson is somehow forced to meet with King or decides King is someone I can deal with as opposed to dealing with, uh, you know, uh, more radical, angry folks, let's say a Malcolm X. Stokely well, well, Malcolm X, the, 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 the next gradation of being radical would be uh, the young folks from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee called SNCC. Uh, they were more radical. last two years of his life, um, suddenly we had a war in Vietnam and uh, the great goals of the great society in terms of dealing with education, poverty, housing, uh, became subordinated to but that But the war. early part of it where they're first meeting and where they're having their intense relationship over the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, during that period, King is more of the moderate, or is that, or yes. does he see King? Because initially, when you were speaking, you spoke of King as a radical. Right. When the, at, at um, to begin with, Johnson would have much rather dealt with the NAACP and the Urban League, but he realized that Dr. King was the man. He had to deal with Dr. King if he wanted to. You know, if he wanted cooperation with the person. What well, did he deal with Dr. King out of fear of SNCC or Malcolm or any more I radical don't, group? I don't, I don't think so. And um, Johnson, in, and finally, there was this absolutely wonderful, when, when the pressure of Selma reached its zenith, uh, there was a sit-in. Some blacks came in as, as visitors, all of them from SNCC. And uh, they sat down on the floor. Where is this? This is in the White House. In the White House. This is at, in the week following Bloody Sunday in Selma. There is a building crescendo of protest all over the country. So these six young SNCC people come in as visitors and they sit down. And uh, the situation is brought to Johnson uh, what to do. And uh, Johnson said, well, give them anything they want to drink, but don't let them go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> but eventually, eventually, he brought them in to talk with him. He brought them in. And among the people he brought in was Rap Brown, the toughest, most radical of the SNCC. People. He just, he, Johnson thought he could persuade anyone if, if, if he could talk to them right. long enough. So how'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of them, not Rap Brown, thought this was a trick. <laughs> and um, You know those wily white people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
the way it finally ended uh, at the end of the day, and again, Johnson, who was a micro manager in this respect, um, gave an, well, an, a, another kind of funny thing was he brought into his office um, some of his very top smart people, Bill Moyers, uh, Harry McPherson, I forget who the other ones were. And he says, you know, you guys are supposed to be the smartest people I have around. Uh, what are you going to do about these people sitting on the floor? Uh, get them to come in and talk with me because they didn't want to come and talk with him. Uh, the, the whole thing sort of ended as a farce where Johnson orchestrated uh, how they would quietly be led out by uh, Secret Service or officers, but two out of that door, two out of this door. He didn't want a scene right. of them leaving the White House. Another question from the audience? Thank you. Um, I guess my question is maybe directed best to you, uh, Mr. Williams. Talking about as you opened up with uh, sort of the parallels of uh, our current situation, it, it seems to me that uh, President Obama is, is somewhat of a uh, pragmatic radical himself. And I was wondering, just in terms of certainly his economic agenda and, and the audacity, as he says, of his uh, um, agenda, uh, how would you see sort of the parallels between these other four individuals who all seem to, to fit that description as well as the current situation um, from a political standpoint? Well, I, I would not think of Obama as a radical. Uh, I would see him as someone who, uh, it, it's, I, I have some tension in my mind about it because obviously what he's achieved is radical. It's, uh, it's the difference between um, it seems to me reinventing or reforming the society and one in which you would revolutionize the society. He is much more of the reformer. Um, and in terms of these four people that we're talking about, you know that he often refers to President Lincoln as his inspiration. And I think there are parallels there in terms of their uh, sense of wanting, and this comes through in your work, John, come, very much wanting to accomplish what is possible at that time and looking for political uh, opportunity and seeing himself willing to take steps. Um, the question is how far he's willing to go, but willing to take steps to try to change the political mood of the country. And to that extent, I would, I would, I would agree with President Obama that uh, President Lincoln is a as a perfect model for him. I don't think of President Obama in terms of President Johnson, uh, because President Johnson literally was a creature of politics and Washington and understood the ways of the Hill in a way that a freshman senator did not. I think, uh, by contrast, President Obama is a shooting star, uh, hopefully one that remains in the firmament, but, uh, you know, he, Johnson was here for years, and Johnson knew the ways of Washington in a way that I don't think Obama does. Let's, uh, Juan, just let's, let's talk for a minute about Lincoln, Johnson, and Obama. I'd add in uh, Douglas and, uh, and Martin Luther King, because Obama has been deeply influenced and inspired by Frederick Douglass, although he doesn't, he typically has not acknowledged his debt to Douglass for reasons. No. I mean, primarily, I think that Obama understands if he says, I've been deeply influenced by Frederick Douglass, enemies are quickly going to latch on the fact that Douglass had been a close friend of John Brown and say, there you go again, associating with another terrorist. <laughs> but in Audacity of Hope, he says, from Frederick Douglass and other black abolitionists, I learned that in certain circumstances, Power will concede nothing without a fight. Absolutely. And he understands, like Frederick Douglass, he understands that the most effective way of fighting power is by using words as weapons. But what, I, what I was getting, getting at, or trying to get at, is moments in history. Lincoln was a great president, and Johnson, despite Vietnam, was a great, great president. 
because at a critical moment of crisis, right. they had the ability to lead, to mobilize, to move the country. Right. It was true with Lincoln. Right. It was true with Andrew Jackson at one point. It was uh, certainly true with Franklin Delano right. Roosevelt. Uh, the, the civil rights crisis was here, whether Johnson Kennedy wanted it or not. And I think you could, one could say we're at the point of another deep crisis today. And Obama will be tested the same way these other people were. And if he can somehow get us through this and come out uh, well, uh, that will be the test of whether he is a great president. Well, we haven't come to that moment yet, although I, people say we're on the precipice. You know. <laughs> but I would just finish off at the response to this by talking about Obama as contrasted to Douglas and King. Uh, and, and again, I think in terms of the black experience in the country, Obama's experience stands apart, obviously. Um, now, if you think about Douglas's parentage, I suppose is similar. Yeah. I mean, I think in, in certain respects, uh, Obama is a direct successor of Frederick Douglass. Both, as you point out, both are children of one white, one black parent. Both, in my view, are among the great orators of their generation. Both are among the great self-made men of their generation. Uh, Obama, even Obama's enemies, acknowledge that he's nothing if not handsome, similar to Frederick Douglass. Uh, <laughs> And uh, both uh, uh, are, uh, uh, have been very, very effective. And what Frederick Douglass said uh, was the understanding that true art can break down racial barriers. By that, I mean Douglass would often speak before thousands of white audiences. And in Douglass's day, the majority of whites believed that blacks were subhuman. And yet Douglass was such a brilliant and eloquent and a magical order and performer that he'd go on stage and he would convince whites, he'd convert whites to the cause of anti-slavery or abolitionism. So whites would essentially shed their racism to the degree they'd acknowledge that blacks were humans and should be citizens of the United States. And there are countless examples during the presidential campaign of whites before hearing or um, experiencing Obama saying, I won't vote for a black man. And then they would uh, listen to or hear or experience Obama, and they were converted to the effective to the degree to which they voted for him. In my view, the part of the reason why the so-called Bradley effect was a non-event had as much to do with Obama's eloquence and brilliance as a performer, an orator, an artist, so to speak, as a you know, I think, the economy. I think I see that a little differently. You do. I think that I see Douglas from what I have read of Douglas's speeches as a first-rate orator. Yes. And I don't see that from Obama's You don't speech. see Obama as a first-rate orator? He's very good. He's good. He's, a, he's, as you said, handsome and articulate. I think Joe Biden said this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> clean, too. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, for me, I can't, I can't think of, you know, too many lines. I, I would testing my mind as we sit here, maybe the audience can help, but of a, of a great line that would you say, oh, that, that's, a, that's Barack Obama's speech at the inauguration. Or, right. you know, I don't see that at all. I think that he is a phenomenon. Uh, he is a phenomenon in terms of his ability to speak out and to, uh, and to have people share his vision of what is possible and to have them believe in him and to believe in this larger picture of a changing America and one that is not going to discomfort or upset them. Mm -hmm. But he, I think he is many things to many people. I don't think anyone listening to Frederick Douglass would say, I wonder what he thinks about this slavery thing. No, I don't <laughs> think he would have that problem. Yeah, no, I mean, I understand that. I, but as a, I guess I, I, I see Obama as, Obama as an order and as a performer as as being, uh, as being uh, really su superb, as being one of the great performers of his generation. Well, let's not leave Dr. King out. Oh, he really? was, he really? was. Now, there's a great order. He, yeah. he was. I can think of some lines from that guy. That's true. <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right. That's true. All right. How, how much time do we have? Oh, were you, Chris, were you saying we have a time issue? Yeah, we have, no, we're fine. Okay, next question from the audience. <laughs> 
Hi. Um, I guess in the scheme of things, if you want to talk about great orators, what you have to say about Barack Obama is that he's um, truly able to communicate and is truly a secure, what, what he has that Lyndon Johnson didn't, um, Lyndon Johnson was engaging in his own redneck way. Um, he was funny and kind of hapless, but Obama has to be put down, I think, as a great orator, and I guess I want to take issue with you a little bit, much as I rarely do that oh, otherwise. Please. You should um, come to my home if you want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. Um, he, he is so innately, it is so internally secure and comfortable in his own skin that other people's criticism, other people's um, efforts to bait him or um, provoke him just are wasted because he is just innately, innately secure and can laugh at himself and can admit fault and that kind of thing, which is a luxury that very few leaders in this country have ever had. And he just um, feels solid enough and real enough where I don't, I think with Johnson, he was always trying to prove himself, always um, insecure, um, knew that the Kennedys didn't like him and didn't want him and that he was just um, tolerated and that kind of thing. And, and, and in that way, I guess comparing Obama, my question would be, um, you know, what does he actually even have to fight in terms of um, the personal issues that Johnson or Kennedy brought as um, with, with the battles that they faced as presidents? Um, Obama, aside from the Republicans trying to thwart him for purely political reasons, um, Obama doesn't really seem to have any personal challenges in the way that these other men did. And so well, what I think would... I, I would disagree. So I'll come to visit you. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think if you, I think of Obama much more along the lines of Lincoln mm -hmm. as relatively inexperienced. Right. Right. And that the argument would be, you don't know what you're doing. Right. Um, not Johnson. I don't think anyone would right. say Johnson was inexperienced. They would say he was manipulative, Machiavellian, and the like, and, and overbearing. But for Obama, it's, the, it's this question of experience. And I think that question is then exacerbated, if you will, by race, mm. which is to say, oh, you're black, and are you really up to this? Are you really of intellectual caliber to do this? And then, it, and then this plays into what we were talking about before with the great orator, Obama. I think lots of people will ascribe, oh yeah, blacks can give great speeches. You know, I think the Republicans at one point were doing this during the campaign. You know, he's a great, even Hillary Clinton did it at one point during the campaign. He's a great speaker, but what about the substance? And so I think there's a, that would be the issue, and I don't know what, if that was so much for uh, President Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln was, was criticized, I mean, Lincoln's enemies um, were, Lincoln's enemies believed that Lincoln was not a great speaker, partly because of his looks, partly because he had a high-pitched voice, which didn't sit well with a six-foot-four frame, partly because uh, he was so self-conscious of his gestures that some critics refer to him as a nutcracker. He'd bend his knees at the wrong time, he'd gesticulate. Whereas even Douglas's worst enemies, King's worst enemies, would acknowledge that they were brilliant orators and performers. A, a word about Johnson. Uh, Johnson made three great speeches, at least three great speeches. The, I, the We Shall Overcome speech that we've talked about, his first speech to the country after the assassination, which was very, very important because we needed someone to reassure and bring us together. And his civil rights speech at Howard University. Um, Johnson was, when you were up close in person with Lyndon Johnson, uh, which we, now you're too young. I'm too young. Yeah, which, which, which I was a reporter. Um, well, imagine he was a Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 Lynn, the Lyndon Johnson who you encountered personally 
was uh, an awesome fellow in kind of the way that Lincoln was because he was, and he was odd looking too, That's right. because he was so big and he was, uh, <clears throat> I think you could say ruggedly handsome. Johnson on television was a total disaster. Unlike Kennedy or Obama or others, he had no concept of, with these couple of exceptions, of how to use television successfully. And so what you saw was this guy with the long ears and the long nose kind of peering out. And, uh, but that was not the man you met face that to face. Was not, people would come out of the Oval Office uh, and talk about how impressive he was as a human being. But he was president in the age of television. And with those couple of exceptions, he did very poorly on television. And, um, Another question from the audience? And let me just follow, follow up on something uh, with uh, John. Um, in speaking of oratory sort of versus substance, as we were talking about a minute ago, um, you know, it, it seems to me that in the 19th century with Douglas and, and Lincoln to some degree, that oratory, you know, was substance in a way in the 19th century that it wasn't in the 20th century even with television or is today, that it was almost a sport you write in your book. John. Yeah, I mean, oratory was, uh, it was a deep substance. So no one in the 19th century would have said someone is a great orator, but um, there's no substance there. Um, the, two went, the two were seen as going hand in hand. The average speech in the 19th century in Douglas and Lincoln's time was two hours. Um, so you think of the Gettysburg Address <laughs> in which Edward Everett, you know, he gives this two-hour oration and Lincoln gets up there. I mean, the reason that we have this only one very blurry photograph, I mean, Lincoln's two-minute speech, you know, the photographer is just, just kind of getting up, figuring this could be two-hour speech. I got all the time in the world. And suddenly it's, go it's over. I mean, the, the initial, the, the most common initial reaction to Lincoln's Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address was shock. Uh, because it was so short, and the second inaugural as and well. And the second inaugural as well. So mm -hmm. it was. It, it really. Joe Biden would have walked out on this guy. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> so it really was an age when I say that the, it was analogous to being a movie star or a um, uh, popular um, singer or a uh, professional athlete. It really was that. That's the closest analogy. Um, and that's where I guess I see that oh, I see there is substance in every uh, in Obama's speeches, in every speech I've heard, and I've heard almost all of them um, at least up until about a month ago during the campaign. He either paraphrases or quotes Lincoln, and and you can find a lot worse people to quote. <laughs> paraphrases usually Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. King is in a lot of his speeches. Mm -hmm. Um, so is JFK. I mean, essentially, in my view, he's, uh, he understands the tradition of great oratory in American history, and he's able to recall it um, in ways. To recall it, or is he a good student? A good student. I in other he's words, he's, so, he's steeped he himself in it. You're, right. you're being outvoted, Juan. I understand. <laughs> um, the other thing I would say to your point is that Obama, like Douglas, and like Lincoln at least, um, all three are immensely disciplined. As, um, as politicians, as orators, and, and the, the three of them are also intellectuals. They were very much Another question from the audience. We've got time for one or two more questions. Well, we ha oh, there's one there, but we won't forget you. Good evening, I just have a quick question about uh, Abraham Lincoln's evolution. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the, his push for the Emancipation uh, Proclamation was tied to the uh, Civil War situation, but I was wondering, and, and we know that that was, you know, incidental of the Civil War uh, situation. But my question is, is there any other evidence other than there not being a record of his use of the N-word that would suggest that he had truly evolved? Yeah, I mean, the, in 1860, 1864, his basic, his primary platform in running for president was 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery everywhere. In 1860, when he runs for president, uh, his basic platform was simply 
uh, prohibiting the spread of slavery with the goal told, toward ultimate extinction. In 1860, Lincoln's vision for when the ultimate extinction of slavery would occur was, as he says in his debates with Stephen Douglas, not less than 100 years. So in 1860s, Lincoln is envisioning that the ideal end of slavery is occurring in not less than 1958. Uh, Four years later, he's calling for a 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery everywhere in the United States. Uh, but to come to the, the heart of this question, the suggestion is Lincoln really wasn't interested in emancipation. He's really interested in, and this is a suggestion in your book as well, he's really interested in defeating the South and unify, making sure the country remains unified. But what you just said is, no, Lincoln early on was saying slavery had to end. Right, well, yes, Lincoln always hate, he's, he said uh, he always hated slavery, but the key to whether or not someone was an abolitionist is what's your strategy for ending it? Um, and, uh, and although Lincoln's chief aim was always winning the war and preserving the Union, the reason the, why Douglas and Lincoln converged is that they understood, uh, they understood that their discrete different goals had converged so that Lincoln understands that in order to win the war and preserve the Union, he has to emancipate slaves. And he has to arm blacks and treat them as citizens. That otherwise he can't win the war. Douglas understands that in order to emancipate slavery ever, you have to win the war. And so their different goals had uh, converged. But in a sense. what about this notion, is it right or wrong, that Lincoln was not interested in freeing slaves? Uh, in, in for its own sake. Yes. He was interested in emancipating slaves. That was, I mean, even in 1860, um, his goal was an ultimate extinction. Uh, but, of slavery. Uh, of slavery. Uh, but at that point, it was very gradually, so as to not uproot the social order. Lincoln understood that slavery was so, uh, such an entrenched institution, was so rooted in American culture that to end it immediately or to end it quickly would be to create a social revolution which is essentially what happened. And Lincoln wasn't anything but a social revolutionary. And so, but he understood that with social revolution upon him, um, that this, uh, and in order to win the war, this is what um, he, he was able to. Embrace. And Nick, and, and, and jumping this 100 years forward, you think of the second Civil War, you think of Johnson dealing with riots in the street with the potential of social destabilization of the country. And of course, he says famously um, that after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, there goes the South for a generation in terms of uh, the vote for the Democrats. So again, we see a parallel. Right. The, the, there are parallels. Johnson, uh, it, it wasn't that we were going to have a civil, uh, that we were going to literally have a civil war. But Johnson, um, the civil rights movement was so effective, particularly when a Birmingham or a Selma spread all over the United States, that the President of the United States, the leaders of Congress, uh, seriously believed we were going to have anarchy, right. if not revolution. So there was the motive there of preserving the Union. But with Lyndon Johnson, when you listen to some of those telephone conversations and when you, when, when you understand his whole background of growing up with a populist father and grandfather who as state legislators fought the Ku Klux Klan, you listen to that guy's voice or I listen to his voice and I think that Johnson in his gut uh, wanted justice for black Americans and brown Americans. I think he felt it very deeply. As, as I think Lincoln did. I, I, Lincoln said on numerous occasions that he hated slavery as much as any abolitionist, and there's little reason to doubt that. Um, but as I said, the, the question is, what's your strategy for ending slavery? Okay. Last question. First, I'd like to thank you for being the mother of a senior in high school who's getting ready to go to college and wants to be an historian. And um, the Civil War 
period is his passion. So thank you. This is like coming to Barnum and Bailey Circus for five years <laughs> for him. But my, my That's question... That's the way I feel trying to herd them. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, um, both of your books, the anchor is the, um, the war between two titans. And we, we know of, uh, we speak about Barack Obama, President Obama, you know, in this glow. But my question is, does a president need a, another titan to have historical prominence? And changing from the past and being historians and putting on your, putting, looking into your crystal ball and becoming prognosticators for a minute, who's on the horizon that could be his titan? That's a great question. I, I, I've, you know, I've, I've had that before. Who is, who's the equivalent of Obama's um, Lincoln? You know, I'm going to turn it over to Juan. <laughs> <laughs> well, let Nick have a shot, and I'm glad to jump in. But please yeah, go right ahead. I, I wouldn't. Um, whether we're, whether we're going to get a Titan or not, I don't know. When, when you listen to the debates of the civil rights, when you, when you listen to the people who were the leaders in the 1860s who were dealing with this issue, uh, when you look at the Senate of the 1960s uh, with Dirksen and Humphrey and Javits, we are short on titans. Mm. But the, the critical, at critical moments of history, when we needed bipartisanship, people have stepped forward and been, in, been important. Uh, Stephen Douglas, uh, Lincoln's uh, rival, arch enemy, rival, yeah. when the crisis got tough enough, he stepped forward yeah. to support the president. During, uh, after World War II, um, during the Cold War, we, we often hear about a Senator Vandenberg of Michigan a Republican who stepped forward to be a partner with Truman. Uh, the first couple of votes we've had, you know, two Republicans uh, joining as we're dealing with this incredible crisis, I think there is going to be the need for leadership, someone in the opposition uh, to become a titan and say the country's at stake here, and uh, someone who will form a partnership with him. Uh, is that someone going to step forward? I don't know. Well, the, in the terms that you're talking, Nick, I think that obvious someone's John McCain. Uh, and it would be a matter yes. of a rivalry there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe even today, uh, you heard Obama, you know, when he's talking about something, saying, even John McCain says, yeah. Buddy, but you know. But McCain could be that person. Could be that person. Mm -hmm. But you know, I thought in listening to your question that obviously what we're talking about is here racial issues. And that someone emerges who acts not simply as a, an equal, but as an antagonist mm -hmm. and forces that person's hand. Now, obviously, if you're talking about black leadership in the country today, if you look to the Hill, they are essentially neutered because most of those people were Clinton supporters. Right. And most of them, uh, in terms of their constituency, worry about the fact that black America is in a tizzy over Barack Obama. They don't have the luxury of saying, you know what, this President Obama is not moving quickly enough. He's not taking concrete steps to satisfy our agenda. They don't dare say those things. So and they say, uh, the reason I say they don't dare say it is because it would be at the risk of their political extinction in their home communities, and they all want to get reelected. So to my mind, if I was to imagine this looking forward, I would say you look to the great issues of our day. And on the racial front, there is no greater issue than immigration. This is a populist, difficult issue. If you think back over the last few years, I don't think there's anything, any issue where you've had Republicans, a Republican president, Democrats controlling the House and the Senate, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, I could go on, all on the same page. Yes, we need immigration reform, and yet such a backlash against it that it stopped, it paralyzed the Congress, could not act, President, everybody else defeated. 
I think President Obama wants to put in place some kind of immigration reform. He's going to have to do it against tremendous opposition. They'll come back to McCain, who comes from a border state. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody like McCain who will rise up and possibly force, put fire to the president's feet, force some sort of compromise, and make history? But there's another element here, Juan, and I thought it was going to happen. Um, somewhere when President Bush was, was trying to, he, President Bush was trying to do what he saw himself as trying to do what Johnson did, mm -hmm. to do a brave act where his own, where the uh, base of his own party wasn't gonna be with him. But the element that almost I thought was gonna happen didn't happen. There has to be a popular movement out there akin to the abolition movement, akin to the civil rights movement that will bring the issue uh, to a crisis. Right. Of immigration. Yes. Yeah. It started to happen with uh, a one day work stoppage a couple mm. of years ago. Mm. And you waited to see whether this was going to, uh, to grow into a movement. It didn't, but it could. Right. It could. Well, let me just start by, stop, I should say, or start, however you want to do it, by thanking Nick Katz, John Stolfer, for being such wonderful historians and for being with us tonight. Now, I believe it's the case, and Chris, you might help me, that both of these learned men are going to take some time to sign books outside. Is that true? Sure, I'd be happy to. We'd be, I'd be happy to. <laughs> yeah, yes, right outside in the lobby. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining us again. And uh, we'll uh, have our, our authors out in the, in the lobby in just a minute. Um, and thank you again, Juan. And uh, thank, you. thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you.